Hey there, and welcome back to Mass Effect 2. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our Mass Effect 2 Insanity walkthrough, a series that has been going on for well over a year now. It started in 2018, accompanied us all the way through 2019, and will very likely see its grand finale at some point this year. Before we can get to that, however, we have a few more missions to complete and very fittingly, today we will actually wrap up the last N7 assignment, so the last side mission that can be acquired by scanning planets throughout the galaxy. All that is left afterwards are a few loyalty missions, DLC content and the main storyline, so we are indeed approaching the end of the series, one completionist step at a time. Now for today, we'll start things off with another round of conversations, and as a matter of fact, we will be talking to the same two squad members we also already spoke to in the last video, Thane and Samara, and then we'll also have a brief talk with Jack. Before we head down to the cruise corners, however, we can quickly get some research done, starting with the fifth biotic damage upgrade, which is shown as the last one here, but there is actually one more since we grabbed one from the Firewalker DLC in the last episode. Our second upgrade is then the Heavy Weapon Ammo Capacity Upgrade, which we acquired from the Blood Pack base in episode 46. And that would be all for now, so let's take the elevator down and have a chat with Thane next. Do you need something? Have a few minutes to talk? Of course, Shepard. Join me. Still talking to Cole yet? Yes. It's still difficult, but he seems less angry. Will you hear my confession, Shepard? And what kind of commander would we be if we refused here? But let's do it with a hint of annoyance for two free renegade points. Lately, it feels like all our discussions are confessions. I've been introspective since I came aboard. That needs to change. When I married Erika, the Hanar let me leave their service to raise a family, but I had no other skills, so I freelanced. When Erika was killed, I pursued those responsible. Once I'd eliminated them, I had no goal. I accepted the Dantius Commission because I didn't know what else to do. Our dialogue choice here does not matter in terms of morality points, but I feel like pointing out that Thane was walking a dangerous path might be a good thing to do. Not the healthiest attitude to take on a mission. You're right, it's not. Looking back now, it's clear I'd resigned myself to death. I would have fulfilled my contract. If Nasana's guards caught me afterwards, it would have been a good death. But someone else was pushing to reach the target, forcing me to move faster, challenging me. I had to reach her first. So it seems like our appearance at the Dantius Towers may have lit a new fire in Thane, although that is once again pretty concerning above all else. You're alive because I have wounded your pride? Pride is the line between a professional and a thug. Your mission gave me purpose, a cause to die for. A chance to atone. I was able to speak to my son again. I can leave my body in peace. Final dialogue choice of the conversation, and here we'll make sure to grab two Paragon points by telling Thane that we're happy for him, showing our full support as his commander. You've had a hard life. You deserve some peace. Whatever may happen, my gun is yours. And that's one conversation down, two more to go, and we will continue just like last time with Samara. Shepard. Anything new? There is something I've wanted to tell you. I've done many things in my lifetime. I thought the galaxy held nothing new for me. Since joining you, I've realized how much more there is. Now, this conversation consists mainly of a few interesting bits of lore and background story, so let's begin by asking her to tell us a bit more about her adventures. You must have seen many things in your years of travel. As a maiden, I served as a mercenary. I fought tyrants and pirates. I experienced everything the galaxy has to offer. As a Justicar, I saw parts of Asari space few know about. I destroyed villages and saved cities. I even fought a Spectre. Okay, and that short summary already gave us quite a few things to inquire about, so let's ask about them all and learn a bit more about Samara and her past. Why would you destroy an entire village? 
I tracked Morinth to a remote colony world. She'd perverted an entire town, making them worship her and bring young Asari as sacrifices. When I arrived, she fled, throwing her minions at me in waves. They bought her time with their lives. When it was done, only small children remained. I left them in the Authority's care and continued my pursuit. Why did you fight a Spectre? A Torian named Nihilus. He may have been on Council business, but I witnessed him kill an unarmed civilian. Following the code, I attacked. When we met, I witnessed you kill a Merc who had no chance against you. That mercenary was armed, and I offered her a way out. She chose to ignore it. Nihilus seemed like an honorable Turian, and a good Spectre. He may have been. However, killing unarmed civilians is wrong. How did the fight turn out? I had the advantage, but he was good. He returned fire and tried to run. We played cat and mouse in the wilderness for two weeks. It was exhilarating. Finally, he created a situation in which my only options were to let an innocent die or pursue him. The code compelled me to save the innocent, and he escaped. I admire how he adapted and used my code against me. What was being a mercenary like? I was a young, impulsive maiden who discovered her talent for combat. I reveled in it, until the day my troop was hired to guard a mysterious shipment on its way to some clandestine drop-off area. I discovered the shipment was slaves, to be traded to the Collectors for advanced technology. You supported the slave trade? In my foolish youth, I'd certainly engaged in questionable practices, but never anything patently unjust. I demanded that we turn around. My mates disagreed. After they were dead, I brought the ship around. The collector craft was just arriving. They closed faster than I could flee. Fortunately, we were close to the mass relay. I got through, and they did not pursue. What did you do with all the slaves? I lectured them on the virtues of strength and defending oneself. Then I distributed the armor, weapons, and credits of my dead colleagues and released the captives on the Citadel. What have your years as a Justicar been like? Mostly tedium and hardship. Traveling on freighters, wandering through rural areas, rooting out injustices big and small, putting down corrupt officials. When I arrive in a remote area, individuals often approach me with matters of justice. My judgment rarely turns out the way they hope. How do you pay for transportation between worlds? Asari captains often welcome Justicars. We reduce pirate attacks. One raid was called off when the pirates were able to verify that I was aboard. Alright, we have finally exhausted all dialogue options and can now shift our focus back on the mission at hand. We're not done with this yet. I am sure. It will be my honor to be by your side at the end. To wrap things up, we can also obtain a few Paragon points, and two can be had by pointing out that Samara seems to have a rather pessimistic outlook on things. You think we're all gonna die? You've assembled a powerful group, but we are fighting an unknown. I am ready for whatever comes, but I do not fool myself about our chances. And while that might be a very healthy attitude considering our circumstances, let's spread some positivity anyway. At least it will give us two more Paragon points. We'll finish this mission and live to see the end. I hope you are right. Alright, that concludes our talk with Samara for now and leaves us only with Jack, who we can find, as always, down in engineering. Hey. Tell me something I don't know about you. Nothing to tell. Why? And here we can immediately start things off by going for two Paragon points, stating our curiosity as the reason why we came. I want to know more, and I'm not going away. I'm here to fight for you. Nothing says we have to be friends, but whatever. Something you don't know, huh? Obvious stuff, like what's up with my ink, or something else just as boring. You're not really interested unless it affects you. I've been through all this shit before. Now, unsurprisingly, Jack brushes us off, but maybe she opens up a bit more if she realizes we're actually being serious, an option that will also earn us two more Paragon points. I could be genuine. 
You have no way of knowing. I have eyes, and I have history. You'll back off. As soon as you realize you're not the first, and I'm immune to your help. So, now we can in fact ask a few more personal questions, and since Jack already mentioned them herself, let's start with the tattoos, and then move on to friends and relationships. Oh, bite. What's with the tattoos? Some are for prisons I've been in. Some are for kills. You know, good ones. Some are for things I've lost. Those aren't your business. They're nobody's business. And some are because, hey, why the fuck not? You're tough. But you can't have survived alone all these years. When I was starting out, I ran with this girl Manara and her boyfriend. They knew their way around. I thought they'd help me. <sighs> right. They helped me into their bed. And when we finally did take down something big, they helped themselves to my share of the take. I knew where it was heading. And I got them first. Never bothered with friends after that. They sound like selfish pricks. That doesn't mean they were going to kill you. I get feelings. I don't need proof. I did the smart thing. I always do the smart thing if people fuck with me. That's probably something you should remember. You work pretty hard at not letting people get close. I've been with lots of people. If you're asking about a boyfriend or a girlfriend, no. It's a waste of time and it never works. You let someone get that close, it just means they need a shorter knife. Lonely and alive works just fine, thanks. Seems like you miss it a little more than you want to admit. Pick every little word apart if you want, but it doesn't change the way the galaxy works. Come on, you've been around. Okay, we have asked everything we could, so we can now make our exit. I have to go, but we should do this again. Wait, my turn with the questions. People usually walk by now. Why are you really asking all these things? Are you eyeing me up? Because if this is just about sex, maybe you should just fucking say so. So, yes, we could at this point jump into bed with Jack, but that would eliminate any chance of ever talking to her again in this game, so that's obviously not what we're going to do. Instead, we can grab the final two paragon points of the conversation and take things a bit more slowly. I'm in no hurry. I want to know what makes you tick first. You don't need to know someone to sleep with them. You just have to know where to put it. Okay, maybe we'll talk later. Maybe not. Alright, now even though it sounded a bit like it, this does not necessarily mean that we have stated a clear interest in Jack as our romantic partner for the series, even though that is still an option. For the time being, however, we're keeping all our options open and can now return to the CIC for a few new messages. Commander, you've received a new message at your private terminal. Sneaky as I am, I have installed another small DLC pack, this one consisting of the Inferno armor and two headpieces. The DLC is called the Equalizer Pack and you can read a bit more about the individual pieces in these messages here, although be warned they won't really be featured all too prominently in this series. Both the armor and the headpieces are not exactly what I would call pleasant to look at and on top of that they also don't really offer any intriguing bonuses. As a matter of fact, while we're still on board, let's take a quick look at the items, which we can do by briefly going up to the captain's cabin. And you can see the capacitor helmet looks like someone put a fishbowl on Shepard's head, and while its shield regenerating powers might be useful, they are nothing spectacular either. The Archon Visor leaves a bit more of Shepard's face visible, but for a Soldier Class Shepard, the reduced power cooldown is not as useful as it might be for a Biotic, for example, so we'll skip this piece as well. What we will equip, however, just to show it off in one short mission, that is the Fiery Red Inferno Armor. This armor has a unique negotiation bonus that would earn us 10% more Paragon and Renegade points, but apart from that it's not really all that suitable for our playstyle, and we have plenty of Paragon points already since we're focusing exclusively on the Paragon path in this playthrough. Still, we'll test out the armor in battle today, which brings me to our mission for today's episode. Grunt seems very agitated. You may want to check in on him. Now, we are still in the Hades Nexus, and that is also where we'll stay for the remainder of the video. Before we'll find our next mission, however, we can do some scanning in the Pamyat system, starting with the rock planet Patsayev. This planet is quite interesting because it is home to the largest message ever written by a human being, a message from a disgruntled miner stating that nothing can be found here. 
And ironically, that is not even true, because there is a huge platinum deposit on this planet. Up next, we then have Dobrovolsky, another rock planet with a human mining colony on it, and that is a good indicator of mineral richness, in this case also including a small amount of element zero. Right in the system center, we can find Komarov, and just like its two neighbors, this planet is being used for mining purposes, and so it's no surprise that a large iridium deposit can be found here. In the system's asteroid belt, we then stumble upon Volkov, a dwarf planet with yet another human mining colony on it, and for good reason, as over 20,000 units worth of iridium can be extracted here. So that completes three of four systems, now we can travel over to Sheol, where we only find one single planet. Do not let the anomaly distract you from the fact that there is an abundance of minerals to be mined here, including once again a decent amount of element zero. There is also talk of Prothean ruins in the planet description, reason enough I'd say to send down a probe and find out more. And we find the remains of a quarian ship and there could still be survivors around, so let's assemble our squad and investigate. And for this one we want some firepower, so let's go with Zaid and Grunt. With Shepard in his rather clunky looking suit of armor we won't spend any squad points, but with Zaid we'll spend all three to give him access to disruptor ammo, even though we won't need that for this mission. We can't upgrade anything for Grunt and weapon-wise we don't have to make any changes either, so let's jump right into the action. Seems like we're not alone, but before we search for any survivors, we can grab the palladium in the corner here, then get our hands on a medkit, and then read through the logs in this campsite. In the first entry, we can read about the quarians escaping some geth, but doing so put a lot of strain on their ship and force them to crash land here on this planet. Entry number two then talks about the first few hours on the ground, detailing how the quarians salvaged the wreckage of their own ship and how they suffered their first casualty. They also mentioned the planet to be extremely hostile, so we should be careful in our search as well. Entry number three then doesn't exactly improve things, as we learn that the Quarians have lost over half of their crew due to mysterious circumstances. The rest of them then have banded together in this camp in hopes of being rescued, but with the camp deserted it looks like help has arrived a little bit too late. Still, there is someone or something still alive in the area, so let's take a closer look and see what we can find. As we approach the next clearing here, we stumble upon an injured Quarian, and we can stabilize her, which we'll do, of course. Helping out is what we're here for, after all. Quarian life signs are stabilized. I recommend securing the area in preparation for shuttle extraction. A few seconds later, however, things start to go downhill for us, as we get a first taste of the planet's hostility in the form of a group of Varen who are attacking. And the Varen have one goal in particular, and that is the injured Quarian, whose status is displayed in the lower right corner. If the Varen get to her, they will attack and injure her further, and we might end up losing the only survivor. To avoid such a disaster, we will therefore fire away and give the Varen everything we've got. We have incendiary ammo on Shepard and Rex, which takes quick care of the animal's armor and is then also very effective in slowing them down, and Zaid can also use his inferno grenades to deal even more fire damage and potentially harm multiple enemies at once. Now, on the flip side, by equipping this new suit of armor, we have left multiple weapon damage bonuses back on the Normandy, and even though we did not get a ton of bonuses from our other equipment, our stopping power at the moment is noticeably decreased. It is not enough to entirely endanger the mission, but it does allow the Varen to land a few crucial hits on their target before our shuttle finally arrives. 
We can now get a few more kills as we shoot down the last Varen stragglers and then we can escape and complete this short mission. And here we are, we have saved the Quarian and with that we have completed the last and seven assignment of the game. For our rescue efforts we earn the usual 125 XP, 7500 credits and a container of palladium. And that's all, so let's return to the Normandy. Commander, you've received a new message at your private terminal. Back on board we receive a message from the captain of the Quarian ship Edena, who thanks us for our help and also mentions that the crashed ship had some history with Cerberus. Sadly we don't learn anything more than that, but at least we have made a good impression on the Quarians and that in itself is of course also worth something. And with that we have now reached the end of today's episode. As I said earlier, we don't have a ton of content left to complete, at least not when it comes to the base game. We do however have quite a few DLC missions that I have not yet installed and in the next episode we will likely begin playing through one of the larger DLC packs for the game. You may already leave your guesses in the comments below while we make the cut right here. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up and if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further then you can go ahead and subscribe or check out and maybe pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.